And in 2014, Mr. Ashley and some of his advanced video students, including all of us, yes, Rachel, including us, were lucky enough to take a trip to Sheboygan, Michigan, where we were able to film biologists studying sturgeon in the Black River. We also got to explore the outer region of the Black River, looking for native amphibians, reptiles, and other critters. My favorite part was going to the Pigeon River State Forest in search for elk. Instead of telling all you folks at home about this, why don't we just show you? Welcome, Welcome to, to our episode of Michigan Wildlife Adventures. We arrived at the house we were staying at on a Friday. It was a big, beautiful house on Mullet Lake that was large enough to accommodate our group of 10 students and three chaperones. On our way out to meet up with the biologist on the Black River, we made our first discovery of the trip, a wood turtle. Find it right here, we're along the Black River. Um, and Basically, another characteristic about the wood turtle that makes it easy to tell is they generally have an orange neck or some orange coloration. But they'll have an orange coloration on their, their limbs and generally on their neck. They like to eat worms, grubs, things like that on land. They're not a big like fish eater. Um, they'll even go after some crustaceans, which is part of the reason that she has more of a, a hooked beak there. Sam, Sam noticed the limb earlier, and we'll see if she'll get it out in a little bit. She's missing a couple, uh, couple claws, a couple things from the hand. It's so difficult for a turtle to, first of all, hatch from an egg because the mortality rate, of, uh, mortality rate, which means basically the number of turtles that have died before they even hatch, is about 90%. And that's because of raccoons, skunks, all these animals that dig up the eggs. Then when they do hatch, the chance of them actually growing up to this size, especially wood turtles, is probably I mean, my guess is about one out of a hundred will make it to some type of, you know, teenage to adult years. Um, so she's a pretty lucky turtle. They really take their chance in this environment up here, moving around with the bear and everything else. Um, bear, wolves, fox, all kinds of different animals that can get these raccoons are one of their worst predators. They literally can just pick them apart. The Blanding's turtle I talked about earlier, can, it has hinges. It's a semi-box turtle, it can close. This turtle, if she walks around on land, an animal finds it, wants to eat it, literally just rips them apart. So that's why she's missing some of the claws. Um, Tommy and I have found, uh, Tommy does the Team Reptile stuff with me. we found probably, well, I don't know if you've ever found a wood turtle with me, but when I've taken groups and we found wood turtles, um, almost every single wood turtle we find is missing a limb or has a stump for a limb or missing part of the tail. Um, the head, they can protect themselves a little more because they can bite and they can get their head all the way in. But as you see, their limbs right here, I mean, an animal could easy, easily grab those limbs and pick it apart if they wanted to. How big do they get? Wood turtles, probably the biggest wood turtle I've ever seen was not twice the size, maybe, maybe another third of the size. Um, females generally, that's why I'm a little surprised about this one, females generally are larger because the, the females are usually bigger in most turtle species. Anyone know why? What is it? Eight. Yeah, they have more egg carrying capacity. It's like snapping turtles. Most huge snappers you find are females because they're going to carry, you know, they're going to carry a lot of eggs. Though. So, wasn't there something somebody else asked? Anybody want to hold it? She doesn't peed on me. Yeah. 
After we let Just the word turtle go, water. we made our way over to the Black River Sturgeon Hatchery where we met up with the local biologist, Dr. Kim Scribner. Um, now, is this the actual hatchery or is this just the research? Uh, it's both. It functions both as a streamside research facility and a, um, a production facility. So okay. uh, we um, contract with the DNR, so part of the funding that runs this, the research grants that we have includes a production component of it. So some of the people that we hire, part of their responsibilities is involved in, uh, in producing fish to, to stock out uh, in the Sheboygan River uh, drainage uh, okay. for restoration. Year. And, the, and the research fish that we produce uh, in the context of our research is likewise, uh, those fish are likewise stocked back out. Okay. Huh. I mean, I would think cool? so, but yeah. I, don't, cool. I think it's very uncommon for them. But I'm wondering if they do, how much it costs hey, to. How big are the surgeons are? A baby, like well, you know babies what I mean? Well, babies are about like through. this big. So <laughs> one start, a surgeon costs a oh, certain like amount of money to raise, right? <laughs> The next morning, we arrived at one of the research sites along the Black River. It was a very cold morning, but we were all excited to get started. Hi, I'm here with Sharon, who is a Sturgeon Ambassador for the Sturgeon for Tomorrow. So will you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, I'm here at the campground, which is State Forest Campground. No, it's not really a campground, it's just State Forest Land. Um, making sure nobody poaches the sturgeon while they're up here uh, doing their thing. And the guys from Michigan State are getting the eggs. And the so how long have you been doing this for? Uh, we've been doing it for 10 years now. 10 years? Ten years, yeah. We camped last year for 31 days. This year's only for two weeks, but it's it's a good thing to do. What is the coolest thing you have seen since you've been here? Seeing kids get to touch a sturgeon, and that the MSU guys will bring the sturgeon up to the top, you know, where they can touch them and feel them, and let the kids see what a sturgeon is like. That is the neatest thing to me. And the neatest thing we've also seen is 40 fish in one day come up. That was cool. It, they were like six in a time going. It was wild. And um, just being out here, seeing the eagles, seeing the golden eagles, seeing the bald eagles, seeing turkeys, skeeks, water snakes, anything. All right, thank you. And so the search for sturgeon began with the biologist heading down into the water. actually have to dive down this very dark water and look and feel for the surgeon. It started out slow, but after a little while, they had their first catch of the day. And then the fun began. It seems like every five to ten minutes or so, the biologists were bringing up another sturgeon. Because of the strong current, the biologists had to sometimes help each other back up to shore. You have to push the center button, Kim. I should have told you that, huh? 
Soon we were up close and personal with a large lake sturgeon. What an awesome experience. Can you see his barbels up there? And then right underneath that, that mouth. The crap up. Rings off the bottom. Filters all the food out. Bottom feeding? Yeah. Nice big mouth, huh? Woo! Just by observing it, you also tag it internally with two uh, Biomark, or Biomark pit tag and an Oregon RFID tag. It's kind of like the microchip you put in your patch. I'm sure Dr. Schumer already talked about it so or will be shortly if he has not. Um, and that way each fish has a permanent identity from year to year. And then while they're in the river, you can identify individual fish as well. Hi, now I'm here with Dr. Scribner, a professor at Michigan State. So what can you tell us about your facility? Well, the facility that we have uh, here actually at the hatchery is uh, both a research and a production facility. The facility was built based on a agreement with uh, a local hydropower company, Tower Kleber Limited Partnership, um, to supply um, a building which would help with the restoration of the species. And so when their license was up for renewal, um, they negotiated with the Department of Natural Resources and they built the building uh, that you were at uh, yesterday, the, the, the hatchery and research building. So the, the building is, is, serves two purposes. Number one, um, it allows us to use it as a research facility. So there are uh, equipments, tanks, um, uh, various other pieces of equipment that allow us to manipulate things which simulate in a much more reduced context um, you know what's going on in the stream right so we have questions you know what are the fl what is the effect of flow or temperature for instance on um, incubation time for the eggs or on larval growth and so these are things that are very difficult to monitor in the stream but we can do so in a highly replicated way so we can actually quantify that in a statistical sense and 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 come to some conclusions about factors which are limiting recruitment um, this whole program here started uh, many years ago with an observation from the Department of Natural Resources that the population here in Black Lake was declining and it was declining rather significantly and so uh, rather restrictive regulations went in place to restrict the fishing to try to minimize the adult mortality but um, we quickly realized that uh, this population really wasn't naturally recruiting right they weren't producing small sturgeon which were um, growing up to sexual maturity and so the research that Michigan State started in collaboration with the Department of Natural Resources started in 2003 and the real goals of that research were to identify the factors which are limiting recruitment so why is it that high proportions of eggs are dying right these females are incredibly fecund so that big female that you saw she probably had close to two million eggs so how can a female that has two million eggs not be successfully reproducing? And so um, the purpose of the project was to learn a little bit more about basic ecology of the species um, and to understand more what was limiting natural recruitment. And this particular river is ideally suited for that work because most of the places that Lake Sturgeon spawn at are very, very large rivers. They're deep, they're very wide, they're very difficult to work in, so it's very difficult to handle a lot of fish. This is a sm relatively small, weightable stream. We have access to adults, eggs, larvae, all the life history stages, and so we can actually um, collect data um, in a natural context, which is really very, very um, unique uh, for the species anywhere in its range. What is the process you go through when you catch a sturgeon? Well, um, the primary information and the, the, the means that we can go back uh, and, and see whether the, these fish have been caught in multiple years are these small little tags. They're called passive inducible transponder or pit tags. They're similar to the little chips that you put in your pets, so if they get lost, you can just wand them, right? Um, and so all these fish are tagged with two of these pit tags. They're, one of them's tagged 
sort of here in the pectoral fin and one's tagged in back and that allows us to do a number of things we can take and wand the fish and we have a 15 digit electronic code where we can see when we caught the fish last um, and we can uh, tie it to a very large database for those individuals we want to also identify the fish so we can see them visually you can't see the tag and it's hard to recognize um, an individual fish and so you'll see these tag these fish are tagged with three inch long little spaghetti tags and they're different colors and we we mark the fish on the right side of as a male and the left side as a female thanks dr scribner we appreciate your time well thank you very much for coming out what an amazing experience we had at the black river with dr scribner and the sturgeon Hopefully we can return next year and learn even more about the study, as well as about Sturgeon for Tomorrow, which played a major role in the protection of this magnificent species. Our next mission for the trip was to find some more reptilian life in the area, including five-lined skinks, which Mr. Ashley has found before in the same area. It didn't take too long before we located our very first one. <laughs> Their tail will come off, so I don't want to pull his tail. They have these in California, don't they? Yeah, Tommy, come down here and get your hand in there. Just try to block him. I know. Don't let him go. He's right. See him? Oh, yeah. You got him? He will try to bite you. You got him? Yeah, yeah. Or her. That's a female, you guys. Ooh, we got one. That's, That's a skink. That's a skink. Wait, all that. It's called all a five that. line skink. Sam. 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 Nice job, Sam. Nice job, Sam. Do you know why it's called a five line skink? Oh, okay. because it has five lines on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah don't move for that. How do you know it's female? Where's it at? Where's it at? You can actually tell it's a female because of the blue tail. Adult males are usually more of a darker color, such as the one here on the right. The five lined skink is one of two species of lizards in Michigan, and they are fairly common in the Sheboygan area. A few minutes after finding these two skinks, we found another skink. This one had actually lost its tail. Check it out, you guys. Isn't that awesome? Oh, why did it fall off? It's nerve impulses because they, they detach when a predator caught. grabs them. Why? Because then the predator will see this moving. They'll basically crawl away slowly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. What's it called? When it grows a new one. I don't remember. A new tail. Regeneration. <laughs> a new tail. Are you guys filming that? Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. No, we were just watching. Well, you never know. <laughs> Isn't that awesome, though? Yeah, it'll it'll heal up fast, though. Looks like the head. <laughs> Here, Doesn't let it? me see the... It does. Where'd it go? Let's put it right by the... See how he's kind of being solid, though? Like, I mean, not solid, but kind of like, like holding still. still. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's because he knows that the nerve impulses will keep triggering this to move. So he's like not moving so that it doesn't attract. Right. Him. What would the predator do? I mean, look at think of a fish or something else. What do they go after? Movement. Yeah. These you things know? hurt when they bite. Yes, they sting a little. Oh, thanks, Matt. I don't think we'll make it. Out. Did you guys know they're born live birth? Yeah. yeah. They're not late. They don't. Uh, they're not born from eggs. Yeah. They come out of the mama. Just <laughs> like. Well, they come out of the membrane. It's like a little jelly membrane. Usually anywhere from like, uh, oh, anything from. I've seen three or four up to 50 come Does out of them. Does it bite? Mom, I don't think it will. Yes, you do. That was delayed. <laughs> Unless it was... You are! Sure. <laughs> you are. Yes, you are! <laughs> oh, yes, you are. <laughs> Our next stop was at an area that Mr. Ashley likes to refer to as the sand pit. Although we did not find much here, we sure had tons of fun climbing up the hills and checking out the scenery. We left the sand pit and made our way to another spot along the Black River. It did not take long before we found a northern water snake. The heck is a mink? The, uh, the eyes would be like almost look at that that abnormal at the top of its head. Alright. This is a... I'm looking to see if it's a female or male. No, but it's a water snake. It is a northern water snake. It's a male. And I'd say probably three, four years old. It's spraying. Is it spraying? Yes. Yeah, you don't want to ride with me if it sprays. Yeah. Yep. Why? Where's the spray at? 
I think it's on your pants. Where? Let me see. Not enough. Do you guys know it's what the spray is? Hands. Anyone remember what I said? It's, it's acid, acid and, and pee poison. It's a mixture it's, of, it's like a chemical. Is it's, it on your hand? Feces? No, I don't think so. It's just water. No, there's like brown stuff on your hand. Other side. No. That oh, right hand. here? No. That right hand. Left hand. On the top. That's just dirt. Oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's just yeah. dirt. Um, these guys give live birth too. So northern water snakes give live birth too. They give live birth? Yeah. They don't lay eggs. Like they're born right from the belly. But this is a fairly young one. Wait, seriously? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mo That's about so half cool. the snakes in Michigan do. Even the rattlesnake. Michigan rattlesnake. Live birth. That's really cool. Yeah. Did cool. everybody, everybody get video and shots and all that? Yeah. Let don't you. let it go, Tommy. We also found a green frog, and Tommy told us how to check if it was male or female. Well, you can tell it's a male because of the way it is. No, no. There's yellow on the bottom hey, jaw. Hold on, let me see. Yeah, there's it. yellow on the bottom where? Jaw. Jaw, yeah. Well, now it's blurry because you put oh, it too okay. close. Okay, Alexis. With bullfrogs and green frogs, you can also tell by their tympanon, which is also their eardrum. They have external eardrums. And when it's bigger than the eye, it normally means that it's a male. Oh, so this is the eardrum. That's the eardrum. That circle is the eardrum. Julia, it's okay, Mr. Frog. After leaving the river, it was time to head out on our quest to see elk. So for that, we would need to hit the road and make our way into the Pigeon River State Forest. Nice. Oh, there's more right there. Yeah. You get some shots? It's going. That's a pretty big turkey. After traveling for a while, we got very lucky and spotted an elk not too far off the road. Going. Although we were only lucky enough to see one elk on the trip, we did get a nice surprise when we came upon a black bear in the middle of the road. Unfortunately, no one had a camera ready, but it did make for an exciting as well as funny moment. Is he still running? There you go. There it is. There it is. There it is. Can you get him? Where? Is is it it pull right up. There. Tell me what to do. It's. <laughs> Can you see him still? No. It, we lost it. You see it? No. Oh. Did anybody see him? No. No. Crap. Oh, he ran fast. Dang yeah. it. It was a little cub, wasn't it? No. That's... No, it was like a yearling. Oh, it might have been full grown even. Anybody else Do your bear it? call. Do your bear call. Do you... I didn't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> believe you when you said you're back. What an amazing adventure we all had. And we can't wait to come back up here to Sheboygan to search for more wildlife. Well, folks, that is all we have for you today. Hopefully we see you in 2015. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Michigan Wildlife Adventure.